want to take a moment and just um, welcome everybody who's joining us online on our live stream. Thanks for, uh, thanks for tuning in today. I know we have uh, quite a few family members that would love to be here uh, today, but are not. They, uh, they couldn't make it. Um, felt the Lord speak to me almost. Um, I sent something out in a group text to our staff this morning. Um, and after I sent it, I was like, whoa, that was a good word. <laughs> It was almost this accidental, and then God really grabbed my attention with it. And um, this, is what I, this is what I sent out to the staff this morning. I said, we refuse to settle for less than what Jesus suffered to make ours. There's so much in our lives that we just settle and accept, and we just receive. Well, that's just the way life is. I'm sick. That's just the way that life is. That's, you know, and um, that's not what the Bible teaches us, Right? Like if, like, how often do we just wander through life as followers of Jesus and be like, oh, I just lost my salvation. That never happens. Why? Because Jesus purchased our salvation on the cross. And when we say yes to him, there's not, we can't just lose it. You know, you can, you could give it away. You could give it back and totally, you know, deny the Lord. That's one thing. But you don't just, man, you don't just lose it because he purchased that for us. So Jesus suffered and gave his life on the cross to give us all the inheritance that he has that's rightfully his. His death and his resurrection made that ours. I'm talking salvation, relationship with the Father, family, right? God sets the lonely in family. It's blessing. It's eternal life. It's renewed minds. It's freedom. Freedom from sin, freedom from addiction, freedom. I mean, contrary to popular belief, you do not have to struggle with sin. Jesus defeated that on the cross. It's provision. It's healing. It's supernatural health and, and more. Do you realize, I, I read something this, this week, that there has been one generation that we know of, of all time, that has ever lived in supernatural health and healing. And it was the generation of the Israelites when they left Egypt and wandered the wilderness. That was before Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross. That was the old covenant. The book of Hebrews says that we now live in a new covenant built on better promises. Jesus literally shed his blood so that we could be healed, healthy, and whole, and walk in that. Jesus defeated sin and all the effects that sin have on us through his death and his resurrection. And with his very last words, he declared, it is finished. That fight is over. The fight with sin, that, that, that fight with the effects of sin and, and, and the brokenness of humanity, that, that fight is over. The enemy is defeated. As followers of Jesus, we rightfully have inherited all that I mentioned before and so much more. So what we face day to day sometimes shows us something different. And what we see in the world, even within followers of Jesus, it shows us something different. Because we still struggle with sin. Because we still get sick. There are, there are those that still struggle financially just to make ends meet. But listen, just because that's our experience does not mean that's God's plan for your life. We, we, do not, we do not create theology based on our experience when our experience is less than the Bible. And less than what the Bible says is mine and is yours, rightfully ours. So today, with communion, we fight. And this, this is how we fight. David wrote in Psalms chapter 23 and verse 5, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I love the way the Passion Translation interprets this. The Passion Translation says, You become my delicious feast even when my enemies dare to fight. When the enemy dares to fight you, Jesus is your feast. So we fight by feasting on the Lord, 
We fight by receiving all that he's done. There's not a, like, there's nothing that we have to work to do. He's already done it. We, by faith, have to take it and refuse to allow the enemy to take it from our hands. We fight by remembering what Jesus did on the cross. And that night that Jesus met with his disciples and had that last meal together, he, he took the, uh, the bread. So if you want to pop the top of your communion cup. He took the bread and he said, this is my body, which is a metaphor. This is like my body, given for you. He said, do this in remembrance of me and everything that was accomplished through his death in his body. Let's take the bread. Thank you, Jesus. And then he took the cup he said, this is my blood. Shed for you. It's by his blood that we are transformed. That we are made clean and righteous and holy. It's by his blood that we have a new covenant of better promises. Let's remember how Jesus shed his blood. So whether you're here or you're watching online, look at your life. And if you're seeing a, a spot, a space that you're like, man, that doesn't line up with what the Bible says. That doesn't line up with some of the things that, that I just talked about. I am struggling with sickness or a disease or a, a deficiency or in, infirmity. I'm like, I'm, I'm getting old. My body is breaking down. That's not what Jesus paid for. I'm, I'm struggling financially and I just, no matter how, how hard I work, I just can't seem to get ahead. That's not what Jesus paid for. I'm struggling with sin and, 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 and addiction and these strongholds in my life and I just keep falling into the same habits and patterns. And that's not what Jesus paid for. So when you look at your life, if there's something there and it's less than, what Jesus paid for, what he suffered for, for you and I to receive, I just want you to close your eyes. And say, Jesus, I receive all that you have for me. By faith, I take it and I say, thank you. say thank you because the supernatural reality of Jesus, what you did for me is greater than what I'm currently experiencing. And just receive. Just thank you. Father, I pray that by your power that you would overcome every deficiency. Whatever that is, in Jesus' name, by faith, we take hold of everything that you purchased for us, Jesus. Everything that you suffered for. And we say, this is mine by faith in Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, before I'm, I'm going to call Shelby up in just one second, but bef before I do, um, I just want to share something that the Lord has, has given me. Um, take a little allowance. Um, hey, Anthony, I thought that was it. Can you come back this way for a second?
Sorry, there's a gentleman up in, in the balcony. His name is Anthony. I, during worship today, Anthony, I felt the Lord speak to me, and I, I, I felt like I needed to share this in front of the church family, that the Father honors you for your hunger and your dedication to Him and for holding on to Him through the good times and through the hard times. And um, I felt like He has... Um, that there is a there, that there's a breakthrough coming for you and for your family because you refuse to give up because you you are determined to stay hungry and to pursue him even when it's not easy and convenient and I felt like you were facing something uh, like, like 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 a mountain this big big obstacle and the Lord is saying to you I will move that when you speak to it by faith so Father I just bless Anthony and his hunger. And God, I even ask more that you would increase the hunger and the passion in his life for you, that he would want to want you more, that he would need to need you more, that your fire would come upon him and that you would release an incredible breakthrough in his life in Jesus name. And I bless that your entire family. Amen. Thanks, bro. Good morning, church. How are you guys doing? Good. I just have a few announcements for you. My name is Shelby. I'm the Connections Pastor here, if you don't know. Um, I'd love to meet you if you're new here. Come and find me after service. Um, if you are new here, there is a connection card in the seat back pocket that is in front of you. And if you'd be so kind to take that out and just fill it out and you can just slip it into the offering basket as it goes by so that we can get to know you and uh, just find out how we can better serve you. I have announcements. Okay, so ladies, ladies, there's been a change of schedule. We've had some events happen that are changing our schedule. So uh, most of you should know that this coming Saturday, the 13th, um, would have been our monthly women's gathering at Gretchen's house. And we've been doing that for a few months now. It's a great time. However, Gretchen is not feeling well. So pray for Gretchen. Pray for her recovery. Okay, but um, this coming Saturday, we were going to be celebrating Holly and the soon-to-be baby at Gretchen's house. Well, Gretchen has fallen ill and Holly had a baby. <laughs> so between the two things, the plans have changed, guys. So instead, a beautiful, healthy baby boy, if you don't know. He's adorable. We should have a picture. We should have just showed the church a picture of him. Put the, put the picture up. Do they have it? Put the picture up. You have a picture? Is there actually a picture? I don't know. Oh, there he is. He's so sweet. <laughs> He's so great. But yeah, healthy, happy. Everybody's good. Mom and dad are good. Um, so pray for them and as they adjust and move into this new season with their, their new little one. So instead, though, of getting together, ladies, on the 13th, on Saturday, uh, between 9.30 and 10, you could actually meet Pastors Craig Renee out in front of the church. Um, if you have a gift to drop off and just bless the Westrick family, bless the baby, they will meet you there and make sure that those items get to um, Holly and Ryan and baby. Okay? So um, we are at the end of our first week of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. Is everybody surviving and doing all right? Yeah. We like feasting and believing way better than we like fasting and praying, guys. But we're at the end of our first week, the end of our first week, and tonight in the prayer room from 6 to 7, we are going to do some prayer room worship. And if some of you were around for the last time we did it, it's a great time in the presence of God. I encourage you to come on out. Families are welcome. If you have little ones, don't worry about the little ones. They need Jesus' presence too. So let's uh, bring them tonight and make it good. At this time, I'm going to ask the ushers if they would come forward as we receive the tithes and offerings this morning. And I'm just going to pray here really quick. Jesus, we just thank you, God, that you are a provider and our friend. God, we thank you for the privilege to give back to you what you give to us, God. I just ask, Father, that you would use this, uh, these tithes, these offerings, God, the things that are above and beyond, God, and the things that are um, what you've asked of us, God, to just reach and further your kingdom and to do what you will with it. In the name of Jesus, amen.
<laughs> it never gets it never gets old seeing the kids explode out of the room. I love it. I mean, honestly, it's better than having them being dragged out right by their by the ankles by their parents kicking and screaming, right? How would that be for for guests that we had? You know, people checking out our church for the first time. All the kids leave screaming and crying. Jeez, we'd be in trouble. Hey, can we put the picture of of little baby Westrick back up for one second? I was just going to tell you. So, keeping in line with all of the incredible Westrick names. I want to announce to you Golden Suede Westrick. Come on. Isn't he a beautiful? So beautiful. And um, it was, I think it was Wednesday night, correct? I think it was Wednesday night that, uh, that, that he was born. And so we will uh, excitedly reintroduce him on his very first day of church once they've reacclimated to, to life as, as it is. So, um, Over the next month, so for the next four Sundays, we're going to be looking at what, scripture, um, at what Scripture talks about, what it has to say about our sexuality. So for the first three weeks, uh, I'm going to talk about, starting today, I'm going to talk about our original design or our, our identity. Next week, we're going to talk about sexual desires. And the third week, we're going to talk about, okay, in light of those first two weeks, what is our responsibility as followers of Jesus? Now, now what, what, do I do, what do I do with what I've heard? Okay. The very last week, January the 28th, we are going to have a guest minister in with us that day. Uh, his name is Joe Dallas. And I want to make sure that you, you catch this. You're not going to want to miss this. If you are away, you know, catch it on the live stream or catch, catch the podcast. Um, Joe Dallas, I've heard minister several times and he's fantastic. He is an ordained uh, Assemblies of God pastor and a counselor. He's an author. He's a podcaster, a, a blogger, and a conference speaker specializing in this area of biblical sexuality. So he is an authority in this area to speak to, and he carries um, this anointing on his life to minister in, in, this, in this area and to, and to uh, the body of Christ. So he, he comes with, with a very strong uh, biblical stance and, and, and a personal stance. I've, as I said, I've heard him minister a few times before. He's going to share a little bit of his, t- of his testimony, which is extremely powerful. And, uh, and he's going to talk to us from the Word uh, and wrap up our, our four-week series on, uh, on sexuality. Um, and so as we, as we get uh, started and we get rolling today, actually, I'm, I'm going to, I, never, I never ever do this. Can we just turn the house lights up a little bit more today? There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. As we get ready to dive into, honestly, what's, what's a controversial subject? And it's controversial not only in our culture, in our society, um, but it's, it's cult- controversial in the church. I need to remind us before we dive in, I need to remind us that the Bible, the Word of God, is absolute truth, and it is without error. And because it is absolute truth and without error, it alone, the Bible alone, has to determine our worldview. It has to define our morals, and it must define our ethics. We cannot allow popular opinion, emotion, desire from our hearts, relationships to determine truth, because truth is not subjective. Truth is absolute. Truth is determined by God and it's revealed to us in his word. If you need a little bit more information on that, in the summer of 2022, I spoke an entire message on the authority of the Bible. And so if you're like, uh, I'm not so sure about that, I, w- I just want to encourage you to go back onto our website and our messages. You can find that, me- that message there. It's called Trending Now Truth. Uh, and you can find that on, on our website. Um, so today, I'm really going to focus most of my message on teaching what is, instead of refuting what is not. See, I want, I want us, I want our church family to know truth, because that's how we identify error. 
You don't identify errors and false teachings by studying errors and false teachings because they always change and they always shift, right? You discover what's false and unbiblical by knowing what the Bible says. So when we know what the Bible says, and I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with the Word of God, and I understand what it says, then when I hear something that, that doesn't line up with the Word of God, it's easy to recognize and be like, oh, that, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't line up with what the Bible says. Okay. I want to pause and pray before we, 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 uh, we really get into the meat of what I want to talk about today. Father, I ask today that Jesus, you would come, as it says in John chapter 1, full of grace and truth, and that you'd release a spirit of wisdom and revelation in this place, that we would all know you better, that you would open our eyes, the eyes of our heart, and you'd open our understanding. God, I ask for your anointing to rest on me and what I believe that you've given me today. In Jesus' name, amen. So the truth of God's word is what defines us. It defines, it defines my identity. It defines your identity. Like we, we, we are not defined by our sexuality. We are not defined by psychology or what the world says about us. We're not... We're not even defined by our feelings, okay? Our feelings are very real. They're very powerful, but they're not always true. They're not always truth. Because I could feel like if I, if I, if I, if I sinned, say I, I, I stole something, right? And then I could feel like I feel so guilty and I feel like God hates me. But that's not true. Because the Bible tells me he loves me, right? That he doesn't hate me. So do you see how feelings can be so powerful that they feel like they're true, but they're not truth. Since it is the word of God that defines our identity, we have to know what it says. And so today we're going to go right to the very beginning. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 1. It's those, those pages of the Bible that stick together. In everybody's Bible, those first few chapters, they always stick together. So go to Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to look at today how mankind was created. Because right there in Genesis chapter 1 at the creation of mankind, God gives us our identity. So we'll go Genesis chapter 1. See, even mine stick together. I'm going to start at verse 26. All right. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every crawling thing that crawls on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. All right. So there are three things right away that stand out in these three verses that uh, about the creation of mankind that I want to highlight um, right, off, right off the top. Okay, number one, first thing that we notice is that man was created differently than every other part of creation. See, when God created the rest of creation exclusive of mankind, he spoke, right? He spoke light, he spoke land, he spoke fish into the sea, he spoke birds of the air, he spoke. But with man, he said, let us make. And God gathered together the dust of the ground. He formed mankind with his very hands. Humans are a creation that God took into his hands where everything else he used his voice to speak. So we were created differently than the rest of creation. The second thing I want us to, to catch is that man is not like the rest of creation. Now that sounds the same, but it's different. See, mankind was created to rule over the rest of creation. We were not created like the rest of creation. See, we were not only created differently, but we have a calling that reflects our creator as we were made in his image, which is like every other thing that was created. We were created to rule and rule over the rest of creation. The third thing that we notice from these three verses is male and female were created distinct, separate, different, but yet 
complementary. Males and females are not the same. And yet we were created to come together male with female. Look, go back to verse 27. If you got your Bible still open. The, this is the passage that's commonly referred to uh, as the Imago Dei, which is Latin for image of God. Okay, and so I'm going to use that term, Imago Dei, and image of God throughout, throughout my message today. And these three lines are actually parallel poetry. So if you go to the next slide, it's a little bit easier to see when they're, when they're alone on the, on the screen on their own. So this is three lines of parallel poetry. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You can kind of see, get a sense that when we do it that way and we, we pull it out alone, how it, it's got a flow to it, right? That first line lays the foundation on which the second and the third line are built. The second line repeats the first line, but it's in reverse order, which adds an emphasis that man was made in God's image. So the third line ends the same as the second line, um, but the singular pronoun him is replaced by them, which reflects the very beginning of verse 26, which we already read, where God is shown in both the singular and the plural pronouns, okay? So verse 26, it starts, it says, God, singular, God said, let us, plural. That third line also has male and female replacing in the image of God, which communicates a direct link between the image of God and being male and female. So the image of God is essential to who we are in the same way being male or female is essential to our being made in the image of God. Males and females together are made in God's image. We both carry a reflection of the creator that the other does not. See, when a male and female come together, at that point, they represent the full image of God. In, 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 um, if you go to the next chapter, excuse me, Genesis 2, verses 23 and 24, uh, it says, Then Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is the first time that Adam laid eyes on Eve after God created her. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. See, the, the, the becoming one, it does not happen when you stand in front of your friends and family and you say, I do. That is not when a male and a female, a husband and a wife become one flesh. A husband and a wife, a man and a woman become one flesh when they are sexually intimate. And it's at that moment that they represent the full image of God, our creator. So the image of God, it refers to the totality of human creation, right? Of mankind. It's our spirit. It's our soul. It's our moral likeness, right? It refers also to our role as rulers of creation. Let them have dominion, right? Because God rules over all. He's the king of everything. It's also inclusive of our, our bodies as a, as a male and, and as females. We are created in his image. So if there is any attempt to alter the reflection of God's divine image in us, to try and change the Imago Dei that God set inside of us, is a turning away from God. It's a turning away from our original and intentional design by God. And it now leaves us out of alignment with Him. We are no longer in line with God if we try to shift and change the image of God that He set and created each one of us in. Moises Silva, who is a biblical scholar and a, and a Bible translator, he said this, man as a whole, male and female, is described as being made in God's image. Every aspect of human beings is a reflection of the divine image. There are, um, there are some that suggest that Jesus was not created in the image of God. And they, they say this in an attempt to argue that um, Gender identity is not spoken to, and sexual orientation is not spoken to in the Imago Dei. See, what that statement is, that Jesus was not created in the image of God, is half-truth. See, it's right to say Jesus is not made in the image of God as we are, right? Because we are a reflection of God. He is God, right? He is the image. No, he was not made in the image of God because he is the image the rest of us are reflecting, right? So Jesus is God. Hebrews chapter one and verse three says, the sun is the radiance and the expression of the glory of God. But the new King James, you know, has a little bit different language, puts it this way. It says, Jesus is the express or the embodiment 
of the image of God's person. So to say that being male or female is not intrinsic to be made in the image of God is to miss the reflection of God in the biology of people. And to think that we can, we can sexually come together outside of God's created intent, his, his purpose, and the reflection of his divine image is to put ourselves in the place of God. Where now I am the one that determines what the image of God looks like. There's only one throne in heaven. Don't try and sit in God's place. So all of our human qualities reflect the attributes of God, not just some of them, even though they're now tainted by sin, right? Because in, in, uh, in the next chapter of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve sin, sin enters creation, and creation is broken. Humanity is broken. We fall. And everything is changed. Everything is altered. Everything is, 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 is I'll, I'll use this word, is, is, is perverted a little bit. There's, it's just off. So if we make anything except the image of God, the core of, of my being, especially, and, and including, like, our sexuality. It's a distortion of the Imago Dei. And it's, it's, a, it's a slur against our creator that intentionally created and designed us. See, at my core, as a man, I am created in the image of God. And being male is part of my reflection of him. At, at Renee's core, she, she is, you know, is, is created in the image of God. And as a female, that's essential to her reflecting the image of God. We cannot change the truth and the fact of our biblically defined created reality by changing our appearances, our pronouns, or our sexual orientation. The image of God, how he created us, is intimately related to the two sex nature of humans as created by God, male and female. This is what the Bible teaches. Nature demonstrates that humans are sexually dimorphic, which means there's two distinct forms. There are, are clear biological differences between a male and a, and a female. See, in humans, we not only see a separation from animals, like we talked about earlier, right? We were not created like, like the animal kingdom. We were created differently. There's also a separation of mankind into two sexes, male and female, that are completely or wholly complementary, yet each uniquely and yet mysteriously bearing God's image. So a, a, woman, a man and a woman come together in complementary union and they're joined together as one flesh and they bring forth new life that somehow looks like God and also bears the Imago Dei. Males and females created in the image of God sexually come together as one flesh and, th um, and through them God creates another human, whether male or, or female, that is still made in his divine image. When, when you look at the entire reproductive process, it actually reflects the image of God. There are, there are some that would, um, that would point to nature and attempt to, to justify same-sex relationships. And they, they point to what they would call the natural occurrence of homosexuality among, among um, animals. But, but this, is, this is poor anthropology, which is the study of humans. It tries to make us no different than animals. We're different. We carry his image. They don't. We, and on top of that, we, we can't take our moral cues from animals. Because there, there are some that, that will regularly cannibalize. There are some that even eat their own young. But no one uses that as their moral compass. You, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. We can't pick and choose. We're not, like, we're not like the animals. There are some that would, that would also point to rare and, and extreme abnormalities of, of, of babies being born, you know, with, with no genitals uh, or, or sometimes, you know, have, carrying both, both sets of genitals. And they point to that and they say, see, gender is not assigned. It's not determined at birth. But scientifically... Anomalies do not nullify categories 
or abolish binaries, right? Binary means two, two categories. So we, we don't create a category according to what wasn't fully formed and then invite by choice into that category what was not by choice. Those babies didn't choose to be born like that. It's insensitive. It's not the same. Now, then you might say, why, why did God create them that way? And we can't, we can't forget Genesis chapter 3. We can't forget that sin has entered creation and has corrupted humanity. It's corrupted our bodies. It's corrupted the world. We weren't created to die either. But when sin entered creation, it brought with it the consequences that were not part of God's original design as we see in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. This is why Jesus came. Jesus came to redeem us, to restore, to rebuild that last song that, that, that Johan and the team led us in. This is what Jesus came to do. Not only do male and female together reflect the image of God, but they're coming together in marriage to bring forth new life is, is used in scripture as the deepest and most intimate analogy of God's relationship with his people. It's like throughout both the Old Testament and the New Testament, God and his people are often portrayed as husband, God, wife, his people, or groom, Jesus, bride, his church. And then the, the creation account in Genesis lays out this male-female based matrimonial picture, and it sets the stage for the final eternal union of God and his people. Right? This is Revelation um, 20, uh, 19, 20, 21, uh, when Jesus returns, and it's the, the marriage supper of the Lamb, where he is the, the, the bridegroom and the church, we are his bride. There's no other issue, there's no other sin issues that, that is so closely linked with our identity as sexual orientation and gender identification is. We don't, we don't find our identity because our identity is given to us by God, our creator. Like I, I go to the scripture to discover what he says about me. When, when we or when people deny the physical and genetic realities of gender, we allow experience to supersede essence. Essence is like I'm created in the image of God. This is the ess my essence. And then when truth becomes what I feel is who I am, then we allow psychology to usurp or to take the place of biology. And it's at that point that truth is no longer absolute and it's relegating to what I think or what I feel. It's, it's, so, it's so common. You hear this, you could probably, some, probably hear this daily, weekly for sure. My truth, uh, your, your truth. There, there's no your truth and my truth, right? It's the truth. Right? It's not what I think. It's not what I feel. Right? I, like, I, like, go back to my earlier example from the beginning. I may feel like God hates me, but that's not true. Right? So my, fe my feelings, although powerful and real, are lying to me. It's the same, the same belief that says sexual orientation can't be changed also tries to tell us that biological sex can be changed. It's just simply not true. J.D. Greer, who's, a, who's an author, and he, he writes and, and he, he speaks to this, this topic, he says, uh, the Bible never points us to look within for truth. So when we talk about sexuality, it is not who we are, it is what we feel. It is what we do. Your sexual attraction is not who you are. It is what you feel. Now listen, and in no way am I saying that your feelings should be denied and ignored. Because as I've already said, they're very real and they're very powerful. They're just not the truth of identity. And what, what I feel must yield to what is absolute biblical truth. It has to. I'll arm you with this in advance. Gender identity is a topic that the scripture never uh, speaks to directly. 
And what I, what I mean by that is you're not going to find a verse that explicitly addresses gender identity. But it doesn't mean that the Bible is silent on it. See, in God's original created design, biological sex serves as the determiner of sexuality. God designed biological males to identify and present as males and biological females to identify and present as females. This is why you don't find specific verses on gender identity. But we do see God setting his image in created biological male and female according to Genesis 1.27. So um, transgenderism or, uh, or gender identity is not only a battle of, of ontology. This is a, a quote from, excuse me, from Dr. Christopher Yuan, who wrote a book called um, uh, Holy Sexuality. Um, and as we go, go through these next four weeks, I'm going to give you some resources. I'm going to put some things in, into your hands, and um, I'm going to purchase some of his, um, his resources that we're going to give to you guys for free. There's a cost to them, but I want to put them in your hands um, in, in the coming weeks. Um, he says, um, let me start that over. Transgenderism or, or gender identity is not only a battle of ontology, which is the study of being, but also a battle of epistemology, which is the study of knowledge. No matter what the world teaches, Sexual differentiation is not a social construct. Being male or female is an intrinsic aspect of who we are. I want to I want to end today with this. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus is asked, which of all the commandments are the most important? And this is his response. The most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. So the absolute most important directive from Jesus is that we love him. And we love him with all, all that we are, not just bits and pieces, but all that we are. All my mind, all my heart, all my spirit, all my strength, which is my body. I love him with everything in me, all of me. And the next directive, as Jesus puts it, is equally as important. Like, don't, don't, <laughs> I know we say it, you know, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. It just kind of flows, like if you're around church circles, we just, we, don't, we know that. But don't, don't miss this. <laughs> It's just as important to love my neighbor as myself. As I love God, it's just as important as I love my neighbor. See, it is, I can't love God and not love people. It's impossible. Because, okay, God, God is love. God doesn't just love us. He is love. And so when I say yes to Jesus and I surrender my life to him, God, love comes and lives in me, right? And so if love lives in me, what has to come out of me? Love. So if I don't love people, I cannot love God. Just have a, have a, just a real like overview read of, of, of um, 1 John, the book of 1 John, and you'll see and understand that he goes through clearly, actually he says it over and over and over and over again, that you, basically he says you're a liar if you don't love people and you say that you love God. Actually, it's not basically, that's actually, this is what he says. So there are no clauses or exceptions in Jesus' words. We love all people. We love all people. When someone walks away from an interaction with me or from, from us as followers of Jesus, they should feel like Jesus loves them. That's how they should feel. This doesn't mean that we believe the same that we look the same or we act the same. We love them and we show them the way of Jesus who is the word of God. We speak truth in love. We speak truth in grace. And then we give space for them to encounter Jesus and allow him to transform their lives. There, there's, a, there's a story recorded in the gospels of, of an interaction that Jesus has with a woman who's caught in the very act of adultery. And, and the, the people grab her, the, the religious leaders grab her from the, the, the act and they bring her to the temple and they throw her down in front of Jesus and they surround her and they've all got rocks in their hands because according to Old Testament law, she has to be 
it's death by stoning. That's the law. When you read through the story, Jesus says um, to everyone who's standing there, he, he, almost, he almost ignores them. He's like drawing in the dirt and then they demand a response. And so he stands up and he looks at them and he says, he who's without sin, throw the first stone. And then he kneels back down and he starts drawing in the dirt again. And then it says that they all left one by one, dropping their stones from the oldest to the youngest. And then they were all gone and the lady was left in a crumple on the ground in front of Jesus. And Jesus says to her, where are they that condemn you? And she said, they're gone. He says, neither do I. Now go and sin no more. Jesus loved her. Like that is such extreme love. He didn't condemn her. But he did not affirm her lifestyle or her choices either. He said, like in modern day English, stop doing that. I'm calling you higher. See, love shouldn't be absent in disagreement. Neither should love. So that's the one hand, okay? There's, there's almost like two sides to this coin. Love shouldn't be absent in disagreement. But neither should love be our motivator to conform to concepts and beliefs that are outside of the word of God and God's heart. Right? Like, like love does not justify behavior. I love my kids, but if they're doing something wrong, my love for them doesn't justify maybe the fact that they're a liar or they're a thief or they just, you know, they, they, they bullied somebody or like, you know, that doesn't justify, that still makes that wrong, but I still love them. And I, I correct them in that. Love and wrong can go together. Love does not legitimize lifestyle or choices. Love does have relationship even when there's moral disagreement. We can be different and we can love everyone the same way that Jesus did. He loved everyone, even though he did not affirm everyone's lifestyle or life choices. And it wasn't just the woman caught in, you know, in the act of adultery, right? He challenged all the religious people too. He didn't agree with their, with, with the way that they were living their lives because it was all about legalism and, and laws. And it wasn't about pursuing the heart of God. That's why they didn't recognize him when he came. I closed and I, I wanted to end with that because it's very important that you and I understand that in our church, that we love all people. I know this is a heavy thing to talk about. And maybe some of you are sitting here thinking like, Man, I really wish I didn't come today. That's not the message I was hoping for. I mean, if, to, be, to be real, these aren't the messages I, I long to, to preach. I'd rather not. Man, my favorite message is to preach that, that series on revival that we did. Man, I, I, will, I will live there, right? I'd rather stick my head in the sand and just preach revival messages, but Truthfully, that's how we got where we are. We have to talk about these things. We have to teach what the Bible says. We've got to set some things right. right? We, we as followers of Jesus, we have to know what the Bible says and then live by it and not try and somehow bend it around our lives. But I bend my life around the Bible. I bend, not him. Okay? This is, this, this is a difficult thing to talk about, to hear, and to walk out. Because I'm sure we all have friends. We know that don't agree. I, I would even say like vehemently don't agree with what I just talked about. And so this is hard to walk out. The Bible tells us that the world will hate us. Not everyone's going to like us because it didn't, it hated him. 
That's why. But he loved them even though they hated him and they abused him and they persecuted him. And we will do the same. We will love them even if they hate us. Even if they mistreat us, say terrible things about us. We will love them. We will help them. We will serve them. We will show them Jesus. We will, we will walk truth out. We'll talk about that in a couple weeks. Some practical ways. What, what, is that, what does that look like? Let me pray.